Hello, and welcome to the Canadian Story, where we discuss what Canada is, what Canada could be, and what Canada should be. So, Ben, I've invited you back on because I think that it's high time that the Conservative Party actually begin reflecting on what it needs to become in the future. Not just the Conservative Party, but more importantly, the Conservative movement in Canada, which has been consumed by populism, now is facing more separatism, uh, social conservatives. Let's dig into what is the Conservative Party of Canada? What could it be and what should it be? Why not? Let's, you know, let's just go for it. Well, the Conservative Party of Canada can be looked at in a number of different ways. Um, it is the main alternative to the supposedly natural governing party, the, the Liberal Party. Yeah, so yeah. a lot of disparate elements who, for whatever reason, cannot stand the Liberals, naturally find themselves gravitating towards the Conservative banner. There is a philosophical movement, the Conservative movement, that... Uh, is undergoing a little bit of flux right now. Yeah, well, um, I would say a lot of flux. And uh, Globally, people are not deciding. Just in Canada. Absolutely, people are deciding what conservatism actually stands for, and what kind of voter coalition. What who is it going to be for? What does it believe? And there are a number of different competing answers right now. Some of which I am very sympathetic with, and some of which I'm very unsympathetic <laughs> with. Uh, and, but you very know, publicly unsympathetic well, with. Well, you know, it, it, you, you got to make a stand you got, you got every now and then. you got to draw your line in the sand, yeah. And, um, and so. Uh, but where, where do we want to start? Domestically or internationally? I think or? let's start domestically because this is the Canadian story. And But more importantly, I want to really dig into an articulation of a cohesive philosophy right not not just an an analysis or an observation but like w what i hope that we could achieve here is at least at the end to come up with some basic principles we think are important and that truly define uh, the idea of conservatism at least as we i mean obviously this is our personal articulation and and everyone has their own perspective on these things but i think what we're really lacking right now is i don't think even most conservatives can truly say what it means to be a conservative right now well, if if you look at the party's uh, founding principles, so called, in in the uh, constitution, the uh, the principles that were drawn up uh, when the the band was getting back together in two thousand three, you can see an overarching philosophy, and you can also see uh, some areas where it seems to be trying to be a number of different things to a number of different people. And uh, some of that is just the nature of political parties. They're, they're never going to be perfect representations of any one thing. They have to get a whole bunch of people together under the same banner. So you you see mentions of, of markets. You see mentions of social justice even, That's which true. is a, That's true. <laughs> not uh, a phrase that uh, many rock-ribbed conservatives would, would identify with. But you know, depending on how you define it, it's not entirely inconsistent with uh, with the platforms across the years either. So, uh, but that therein you can see uh, where there there's a bit of flux. Is the party a a free market party, or is it a little more of a uh, working class populist party? That there is uh, some contention over that right now. Uh, and uh, going back uh, a few decades, there were always there was always talk of very the red and blue factions. Oh yeah, everyone like, and, loves to talk about that. And a lot of people who would have identified as and been seen as reds a decade or two ago are now uh, somewhat more outspoken and saying that they're the true conservatives and these other people aren't really. <laughs> yeah, no, and, you're right. And, uh, and, and, then, and then you get into that sort of conversation. Like, I, I mean, even take the current leader, um, that at various times he would have been viewed as, as a bit of a red, but he, he ran as a, as, as a rock-ribbed blue conservative. And, you know, whether whatever shade he is, he is the leader, and and he definitely has an interesting direction that he's taking the party. Um, I'm strongly with him on foreign policy, 
and uh, other parts of the coalition, and other parts of what seems to be the the platform that he's heading towards, I'm less enthusiastic about than than I might have been. Um, but you know, that's but it's a big party, and if you're involved with the party, you can generally find something that you like and just kind of make that your niche deal kind with of thing. Uh, the, the the stuff that you're not so keen on as long as nothing's a, a big deal breaker that's that's how you big that build that coalition but i mean part of building a coalition also has to be a vision of the future right and uh and that vision has to be based i think on on fundamental principles that that we create uh and then and, and then adhere to and i think the the big question is, I think those principles were sound fiscal management. I think that was one. Uh, I think, um, you know, a strong principled foreign policy. That was definitely one of our founding ideas, right? Indeed. Um, I would say even uh, provincial rights was definite, definitely part of that, you know, as you said, coming together again that we had in 2004. What I'm not seeing a lot of, and I'm not even saying this as a criticism, I'm literally saying I think this is a problem that, nobody's even spending a lot of time thinking about which we need to is what is conservatism not what is the conservative party of canada but like are we as everyone says you know liberals 10 years ago right <laughs> like you hear that all the time right the the liberals are dragging us forward into into you know this glorious utopian future and and we just we just keep putting the brakes on or are we the you know sober second thought of a Bur of the burkean model or are we free market libertarians like well, it, or maybe it, all those things I, I guess the answer could be yes <laughs> um but uh on the uh, the very much the Canadian front, uh, there is a very different vision of how the Federation ought to operate than uh, what the Liberals have. And in that, I, there's lots of continuity between our, our various leaders. That uh, And uh, with, with the exception of, uh, of the Mulroney years, which involved a, a lot of renovation of the Federation, uh, I, I think conservatives can claim that under conservative governments, there is much more constitutional peace. That uh, the Harper years in particular showed how you can have uh, First Minister's conferences yeah. without, <laughs> uh, without then everyone uh, going leaving it saying that the country was in danger. They they went out of it criticizing the the prime minister, of course, but you know that's that's uh, pretty normal. Uh, yeah. Isn't that kind of a premier's job? You you expect that, <laughs> but yeah. uh, but it did take the temperature down a lot. And I I hope and believe that a a future conservative prime minister would have uh, that kind of uh, calming influence on fights within the federation. And that is certainly one area where. A strong conservative party is is essential to a uh, a properly functioning Canada. Yeah, no, I, I I like that. I guess if we are boiling that down, what you're saying is um, conservatism is about uh, the, the idea of conservatism in Canada has a lot to do with provincial rights, and that usually brings the temperature down because if you're not stepping on provincial rights, you're not going to have the same um, conflicts. Well, different policies make sense in different areas. And this goes all the way back to the great compromise that Guy Carleton struck with the Quebecois seigneurs in uh, the early 1770s. And it's, it's a very organic division of powers, and it has lasted across the centuries. It's, it's lasted uh, longer and, and much more peacefully than our, our neighbors to the south. Yes, um, agreed. And... Uh, and I, I think that's because it, it, it is based on uh, certain things being of national concern, being dealt with nationally, and other things being much more of local concern and being dealt with by the provinces. And when, uh, when each side knows to, to stick to what it's good at, uh, then the Federation goes along without uh, a whole bunch of yelling back and forth between the regions. And how would you see that as a do you see that as a conservative principle, or is that just a Canadian principle? It's well, you're right that the the liberals definitely govern more of a you know centralized power to the colonies, 
than the conservatives ever have, I think. Even although Mo, that was Mulroney's downfall, is he became too liberal in a sense, right? Is by, well, he he tried very hard to get uh, to get a settlement of it, and and I would I would push back a little bit that I would say the Meech Lake Accord, which was his where he wanted the constitution to go. It was his, yeah. uh, if you look at it from a provincial point of view, it is very good in terms of shifting powers to the provinces and in limiting the role of the federal government. His attempt to salvage everything, the Charlottetown Accord, is awful. Um, he put Joe Clark in, in charge of <laughs> getting all that settled, and, and it, it, it ended up uh, with a, a mix of things that nobody wanted. But Meech Lake itself, when it was kept nice and simple and 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 very direct about the reforms, including provincial uh, roles and choosing Supreme Court justices, including uh, a Senate chosen somewhat differently, and including uh, a number of things, that it was based on uh, what Robert Barassa said were Quebec's uh, five uh, demands in the Constitution. And they were pretty, all in all, they were reasonable enough that 10 premiers signed on to it. And, uh, and at first, uh, it had broad support across the country. And then... Well, then, you know, Pierre Trudeau stuck his oar in the water. And <laughs> and uh, and yes. the way things were, the way the amending formula was, that Mulroney had to go vault a higher barrier than Trudeau did. Yeah. Trudeau yeah, it's true. didn't have to get unanimity and, and didn't. Mulroney did get unanimity, but then it fell down on, on the ratification. And I, well, think I honestly was, believe that was an ego thing. It may well have been. Um if you read Trudeau's memoirs and Mulroney's memoirs, you you can decide for yourself, yeah, uh, dear listeners. Yeah. But um, it's it was a very big thing, and and it going down uh, gave us a somewhat stormy decade after that that uh, we very nearly didn't survive, but we did survive. And the Canadian Federation was stronger than the chattering classes in the early '90s thought. I remember I was uh, a child and then a teenager in those years, and if you read books about the future of Canada, most of the books were assuming that there was no future of Canada. <laughs> right, right. And right. it, uh, and if you go back to some of the coverage of Referendum Night, there's a fascinating CBC panel that had both Bob Ray and Stephen Harper on it. Oh, really? I did not know this. And uh, it was, they were commenting right after Jacques Parizeau gave his notorious uh, speech about money and the ethnic vote uh, being the deciding factors in the referendum. And if you look at what everyone's saying, the one guy who was saying, you know, everyone kind of needs to calm down, take things down. Was Stephen Harper? Was Stephen Harper, <laughs> saying that a lot of people really need to step back yeah, yeah. and deal with uh, the issues that uh, Quebecers and other Canadians have on their plates about uh, living their lives and about uh, not getting caught up in, in those questions. And it turned out that Harper, who at the time, I think, was assumed to be somewhat out to lunch on the issue, right, was, right, was right, actually right. spot totally on. Right, yeah. And uh, and so I, I would warn people, whenever there's a consensus among the chattering classes, um, to treat that consensus with a, a, a healthy amount of skepticism. You know, sometimes the consensus has something to it, but other times uh, what they're telling you must be isn't necessarily so. Yeah. I think actually that's a, that is a conservative principle, is the is the caution towards mobs. I mean, we, we've obviously, there's a, like you, there's a strain of conservatism, like you pointed out, that is very mob populist directed. Well, we, we have, we contain multitudes. Yes. If it's we, I'm currently on, <laughs> I'm currently not a member of, of no. the, of the party or the movement, uh, after the, uh, kerfuffle in January, but, uh, stateside, um, and uh, it, it's interesting because a number of my friends in, in the party and the movement, they're, they're, they're not giving up on me. They're not like writing me off as a traitor <laughs> or something. No, it, no. It, I'm not sure whether I'm coming back, uh, but whether I come back will depend on what the party 
and the movement decides to make of itself. Can you can you lay out what you think those are just just so people understand uh, what what troubles you, and not not just in a people wanting to know what's going on with you, but like these are issues that the conservative movement is facing, and that you're. I want you to highlight them because that'll help us sure. maybe flush out our philosophy here. Okay, I I want to choose my words carefully here because I. I Sometimes I do want to upset people, but if I upset people, I want to make I want to be sure that it's for something that I want to upset people with. Right. Um, but we are uh, broad spectrum undergoing a bit of a coalition change that um, the uh, the sort of Cold War era conservative liberal coalition that uh, made up Mulroney. Reagan Thatcher conservatism is no longer the the leading model for a conservative party, and there is a uh, you can look at it in a number of different ways. You can look at it as uh, technocrats versus Democrats. You can look at it as um, cities versus regions. You can look at it as uh, sort of um, Specialists versus generalists, and um, and internationally, two big issues that uh, really divided these things up were in uh, the two major countries of the Anglosphere: the yes. United Kingdom in their debate over membership in the European Union. And the United States in whatever the heck the last five years can be described <laughs> as. And um, and they, they get lumped together uh, in sort of a populism versus anti-populism framing. I'm not sure that that really covers it because I actually split my ballot on those two big things. That, that you're a big Brexit supporter. I was and am a yeah. big supporter of Brexit. I, I think the arguments for Brexit, what with with the uh, vaccine rollout or lack oh, thereof. Oh, there it's it's uh, there, you, a lot of remainers have gone Brexit because of that. Well, you can see the challenges that uh, a uh, supranational organization like the European Union provides in terms of reviewing decisions, questioning decisions, getting officials replaced. Bureaucracy. Um, and, uh, and so that frames it in an area where I am very much with uh, the, populace, the conservative we'll party yeah, yeah, yeah. over there. Um, well, I, I'd say I'm, I'm, I'm with the people who, who like liberal democracy. Right. <laughs> um, yes, yes. But that's also why I then ended up on the other side with, with regard to the United States. That, you know, and I, I, I don't, I don't want to be insulting, but we did have a situation where uh, the president of the United States o- over the last few months of his term pitched something that just wasn't true in terms of uh, an election being stolen from him, that it, it wasn't. And, uh, and well, he I pitched this like- narrative, and then a number of people uh, took the president at his word and uh, believed that they were saving democracy by, by storming uh, the Congress, when in fact they were the ones endangering democracy. And it, it, it's, it's very frustrating and very sad and as an American, uh, I, I'm American through my mother, it was very, it, it was a very hurtful moment for me. I, I took it personally in a way that uh, I suppose one could compare the months after 9-11 to, perhaps. And, um, and so, in these two issues, in, with regard to the uh, having democratic control of our institutions in the United Kingdom uh, versus the the technocrats of uh, the European Union, I'm on one side, and then you can see in the uh, in the uh, bubbling that was uh, the United States, I was on uh, the other side, but I would say that. In my positions, the consistency was that 
I was trying to deal with things in good faith and with uh, as much truth uh, as possible. And therein, I think, is where conservatives have uh, a choice to a make. Choice to yeah. make that they, they, can you outline the choice? What do you think the choice is? Basically, you need to be able to make your arguments in good faith and with when there are facts that you don't like, you have to deal with those facts as opposed to retreating into a, a fantasy world. And, and I'm sorry, that's what happened with uh, the Republicans in the yeah. U.S. They, yeah. they, they retreated into a fantasy world, and it was a world that made sense to them, but just wasn't true. And that, that's the problem. And, and it isn't that one side has a monopoly on, on this, because, again, with the... Uh, if you look over at the United Kingdom, the, the people who were being labeled as populists had, I believe, truth on their side. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> but, you know, that looking at things with, with clear eyes matters. And um, there was a saying um, a number of years ago, I'm, I'm not sure how popular it is anymore, that the facts of life are conservative. Oh, yeah, I believe that. And uh, I... I believed that. I like to think I still believe that, except that that would then require me to say that a lot of the people currently calling themselves conservatives are not actually conservatives. And I don't really have the right to, to make that uh, sweeping statement or judgment. Well, I don't think you can make the statement that they're not conservatives under their own definition, but maybe you could say they're violating my principles of conservatism. And I think that's that's what I was trying to get at here is... And I loved what you said. I love the distinction between the technocrats, the specialists. All I mean, in in Harper's words, the you know, the somewheres and the nowheres, right? There is a deep concern among a lot of the people who do not live where I live. I live in Toronto, uh, but who, who don't live in sort of the 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 big city that uh, the people there no longer consider themselves to themselves to be of the broader country that um that a, a lot of people working in in certain jobs in the big city uh, view themselves as having a lot more in common with other people in similar jobs in other big cities of the world and so the the big question is who's fighting for me and that is where there is a a a big disconnect between uh those who would have once been called the elites and the rest of the country and uh, that's not to say people can't reach across that divide. That, um, I mean, say what you will about the former president. He was definitely of New York, and uh, but was but taken as, divide, as a, yeah. the representative of not New York. Um, and the prime minister of the United Kingdom uh, was the uh, the mayor of London for two terms, and and was uh, very much personified his city. But he now he, has he a quoted coalition the Odyssey is, in the original Greek, I think, on a TV program for ten minutes. Well, when when you study those things, <laughs> uh, you, you you remember them. Yes. I I I'm, my Russian is a little rusty, but. I could have done uh, a few verses of, of Pushkin's uh, The Bronze Horseman. Um, and, and if, I, uh, if I'd if i thought about it, I, I, I would have done it up again for this. <laughs> that would have been great. Na peregu pustinik von stialon dum velikik palm if dal And so on. But, um, <laughs> but you know, uh, well, Boris, uh, Boris Johnson is an example of, of how you can... Uh, make these connections. Yes, that, uh, he really is. He has a deep connection to to Britain's past and a sense of that. And that is why, even though he was the son of a European Commission official who grew up uh, part of his time in Brussels, um, when it came down to it, he made the call that uh, that they had to get out that that mattered to him more than, than his 
his own past, his in a sense, yeah. Childhood and, and professional ties to uh, to the the bureaucrats, um, and and so if if conservatives define themselves as on the side of their own country versus the sort of blob of of the international bureaucrats, I, I think that that is something that I can very much get on the side of. But if people go off into a a, a big war against uh, against certain parts of the country, that um, I don't think he meant to come off quite how he did. But uh, the, the current leader of of the federal Conservative Party of Canada did a uh, a video in in which it was boldly declared that his policies were not being made for people in Toronto. And my <laughs> my immediate visceral response was, well, F you, I'm from Toronto. <laughs> and a lot of people are. And, 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 uh, and a lot of the people writing those lines are from Toronto, which is the funny thing. Yeah. yeah. And, and there's a, uh, I wonder, I wonder if conservatives, uh, if a number of conservatives have so gotten into the the fights that they have uh, against the lefties that they are forgetting the sort of high-minded reasons why they got into what they've gotten into. I I could not agree more. I honestly, uh, we, we had Angelo on the podcast to cancel this. You know, he's writing oh, yes. for the, uh, and I really like Angelo. Uh, and I especially like that he is refusing to be canceled because fuck people who try to cancel people. But... I will say this, um, our, our entire dialogue around politics is flawed because it's creating this idea. We were just, we just had a rabbi on, uh, from Montreal that we mm-hmm. were talking about, we worship politics now, now that, the, now that the gods are dead, that's our religion. And that's the problem is even how you feel like you how you feel right now just because you disagree with something that the conservatives have done you now feel like you have been essentially excommunicated but you excommunicated yourself well right? you know I, mm-hmm. I i did after having 5 years of being told that i needed to really be concerned with with how these other people yeah. felt i thought well what about how i feel yeah, and so yeah. i <laughs> and i i and you know i i i can't read 55 or 60 percent of the membership out of the party so no. the only thing i could do was read myself out and and for now for now and i think i think it's important but you we haven't really dug into so what is the choice so we're using boris as an example of how it can be done well but what is this existential choice that we're, we're coming up on well this may sound somewhat melodramatic uh, that's not a good way to lead into it, but uh, there, there we are. Um, but the the choice is: how much do do we believe in the institutions of liberal democracy? That um, how much do we believe in in actual fair elections and respecting the outcome? How much do, do we believe in institutions? Do we believe that everything is rigged and that you have to take the gloves off and fight, 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 no matter what? Um, because in order to have liberal democracy, you need an agreed upon set of rules. You need loser's consent. And if people decide that there is no such thing as loser's consent because the fight isn't fair, then there is a problem. A very big problem. A, a huge problem. And I, I hope that a lot of conservatives up here who claimed that they believed what the president was telling his party about the election. I'm hoping that people were more cosplaying than sincerely believing that stuff. That it was, you know, he, he's on our side, so-called, and, uh, and that's why people lined up that way. And that January 6th was a sobering event in that sense. I, I'm afraid I don't, I don't think everyone is, but I, I think... I want to go deeper. I said I hope. Yeah, yeah. I think I want to go deeper than that because this is a good point that I hadn't thought of that you just brought up that's really important. Like 
this was being projected as going to happen by the president for months before it happened. He he was all, he was basically putting the country in an impossible situation, which is if he won, well then, you know, obviously half the country was going to lose their mind. But if he lost, he was ensuring that the other half lost their mind. Well, but that's and this is why I'm going to say you shouldn't be following someone like Donald Trump that I, I had been waving my arms for the five years before that, saying, look at this interview in Playboy in 1990. Look at what he says about uh, stuff like the Tiananmen Square protests and about power and, and the use of power and what he actually believes in. He, he is that guy. And even knowing philosophically that that's where he was, I was still kind of shocked when it actually happened. I, uh, there, there's a... Uh, there's a American conservative website called Hot Air, and one of their hosts uh, is, is a guy named Alapundit. And, and uh, he commented that, you know, the, the, his comment was to the extent of, you know, on the one hand, being proven right about Trump is something, but wow, I, I didn't think we'd be proven <laughs> right in this way. Right. And, right. Uh, and, and so... I mean, the, the thing is that our, our friends on the left spent so long crying wolf. Yeah, with, that, with, with uh, Mitt Romney, with even George Bush. Well, John McCain even. Yeah. Uh, certainly Reagan, certainly uh, Bush 41, that uh, when, when a wolf finally came, uh, nobody believed them. But that the wolf was still there. And so with regard to uh, the conservative movement – uh, you need better wolf detectors. Hmm. I like that. You need better shepherds, too. You do. And for a number of years, I took that role myself as, as an EDA president, as a, as a candidate, as sort of a, a commentator in my free time. Um, but when more people than not took the other side of that, I, that's when I just said, you know, F you all, I'm out. <laughs> uh, yeah. And I, and I don't blame you because, I, like, you have to have a line, right? And obviously, I don't agree with your methodology, but I completely agree with your character assessment of why you did it. But going back into what you're talking about on institutions, I think you made a point there that I, I want to flesh out. Um, conservatives at least for where I'm from, inherently distrust government, uh, which, is, which is different than the Ontario slash, let's call it, quote-unquote, Canada model. Uh, and I think America is a lot more like that. Um, how, how do we strengthen trust in our institutions while maintaining what I think is a core principle, which is government is not the answer? Well, government isn't the answer for many, many things. And we certainly need a, a, a big scaling back of government. But there are situations where government is the answer, that you, you want to have a court system. You want to have a currency. You want to have a, an armed forces, um, an army, a navy, an air force. Um, a border patrol. Uh, certainly, conservatives believe in borders. <laughs> true, true. <laughs> and uh, well, right now, I think believing in borders is something like a ninety-five percent position in Canada. If you look at the everyone polling, everyone is. Uh, everyone wants to just keep them shut. Yeah. Yeah. Funnily, I, I, I don't. I, I, I want that border to open up again. But we need to get a, a lot more vaccine in here yeah. before we're able to. Yeah. Certainly. Um. But. Uh, but you know, it, you can see in those things where there are there are situations where, of course, you need you need a state, um, but you need a limited state. You need limited governments, and and the, and therein, I think, is the uh, a found the foundational conservative principle. Yeah, that uh, if you can get to limited government, if you can get to a healthy respect for our history and our institutions, I think a lot of conservatives right now. Are a little lost that they feel yeah, that, that's exactly my point under cultural attack 
that the the people holding the heights of of the cultural institutions have been engaged in an assault on our past, on figures of our past, on our founding prime minister, on uh, even uh, apolitical institutions like the monarchy, the uh, all of these things, and it has left people wondering if anything is sacred, and if nothing is sacred, and if anything can go, then what is there to stand on? And that's when people are are vulnerable to the wolf. Mm-hmm. Oh, and I saying, mean, you know, look, uh, I will protect you. Never, never mind all those other people. I'm on your side. I'll fight for you. And that is a deeply attractive pitch for where a lot of conservatives are at. Strong men, right? Like, uh, well, in in that notorious Playboy interview in 1990, where Trump expresses his approval of the Tiananmen Square massacre, he talks about the power of strength. And at various points in the history of Western civilization, people have been very drawn to that. And especially when you get down to what seems like a street fight between left and right. That's that's what happened in the interwar period. Yep, yep. And not just in Germany, that you can see a lot it of it. It happened in Spain. It happened in It happened Italy. in France. Yeah. That uh, Trump's uh, Trump's guy Bannon was going around pitching uh, some French in- intellectual thought from the interwar period from one of the guys who was on the Academy Francaise named Charles Morat, and uh, Action Francais was was the magazine that he ran, and a lot of sort of French fascist thought came out of that, and. Um, and some of the the other people who went to the dark side were pitching stuff from some of the the nationalists in the interwar period more some of them from eastern europe i don't remember those names offhand but th- these ideas that had been kind of ruled out of bounds people are rediscovering them because they are trying to find a a bastion of strength that they feel they do not have from uh the institutions as they were. Well, because they, they uh, feel like the, the institutions decade. have been taken over, right? They do feel that way. And in, in some ways, they're not wrong to feel that way. But, and there's always a but, if you're looking for something to hang your hat on, you need to choose that thing very carefully. Yes. Well, like, in life as in politics, the, your first principles will end up being your whole life. Well, when you're not sure where you are, that is what you need to do. You need to retreat to first principles. So what are your first principles, Ben? That's a very good question, and I'm sometimes a little fuzzy-headed about it. Um, so I'll, I'll try not to be too, too broad, but generally speaking, I, I'm a free market guy. I think that... Uh, if the private sector can do something, the private sector ought to do that thing. But unlike some of my friends who who uh, went uh, who drank very deep of, of the libertarian classical liberal mm-hmm, uh, pool, mm-hmm. um, I nevertheless like our institutions as they evolved. I think that uh, the the common law legal system, uh, the institutions of Parliament and the Crown and all of that, that they have been tested over time as being very effective ways of exercising power, well, gaining power, exercising power, and having a peaceful transition to somebody with a different view of what ought to be done. And um, and that it, it has been able to go through an, a number of different uh, changes of direction across the decades, sometimes for the better, sometimes for the worse. But if nothing else, you've been able to have those changes. So a fundamental other principle is uh, democratic control of, of our state and of our yeah. institutions. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and so those things together, that, that believing in, in the private sector, free markets, in uh, democratic institutions and in the historic development of our democratic institutions, including the constitutional monarchy. Those, those are, with my Canadian hat on, 
uh, where I would hang my hat. And until until very recently, I was convinced that that was the Conservative Party of Canada. And now, I guess your fear is that they're heading down a road of strongmen. Well, I'm not. I don't believe the leader is that. Sir, I think the leader actually probably agrees with almost everything I just said. Right, right. But the the issue is the membership and the people who make up the movement and um, and where where that sort of mass of people wants to go. And I don't know where that mass of people wants to go. That uh, a majority of them, I would say, uh, were very drawn to, uh, in, until certainly, uh, I'll say until the end of 2020, were very drawn to uh, what was going on south of the border, that approach. And if that's where people want to go, then the party can continue to count me out. Yes. Uh, here's an interesting. Uh, here's an interesting thing to think about. Mm-hmm. Is um, so much of the world right now is defined by what I am not, not what I am. Right. Right. And so, like, Democrats are less identifying as Democrats than that they're not Republican. Sure. And similarly, Republicans are no longer identifying themselves as Republican necessarily. They're defining themselves as not Democrats. Or not the radical left, I think they would say. Exactly. I'm not and, and you know, it's funny when you when you look at it that way, because I think that you're wrong about who makes up the Conservative Party, but not entirely wrong. And here's what I would say about it, okay? I think that that cleansing is happening. The truly the Trump we'll call them the Trumpkins of the Conservative Party were the Derek Sloans people, right? He would, he, that was the Could message be. he was delivering. And what does the leader do? And I'm, I don't want to defend, I'm, I'm not here to defend the CPC. I'm here to get to the philosophy of what the conservative movement needs to be. And I loved your, your two principles, I think. Getting, if we can get back down to that foundation, we're in good stead. And we're seeing the liberals not live up to either of those. So, well, I mean, we're, we're running, what, a $400 billion <laughs> deficit right now? So, yeah, you know, yeah. what, <laughs> who, who knows where we're going to be in a year or two. Yeah. Um, um, but, but going back to what you're saying, I think, like you said, the leader probably agrees with everything you said and is working on purging uh, anti-democratic uh, elements out of the party. But uh, I think w- I want to go back to this idea of what we are, not not what we're against, right? And because we live in this void of meaning that exists in the in the post, you know, in a post God haunted world, right? Where where, mm-hmm. where we where we now have no definition of what matters and what doesn't truly uh, that we all agree upon, where it used to be different. There was, you know, there was found there were first principles that everyone agreed on. Whether they lived by them or not was different. They at least had to pay homage to that. And now we're yeah, seeing... No, hypocrisy is very important. Yeah, yeah, it is. And I think that if we can actually begin to celebrate what we are instead of attack what we're against, that is one of the paths that we have to take forward. And so I guess... The reason I'm asking you this is, yeah, you're right. This, there is this choice that's that's being made. Um, but what should we be? <laughs> right? And it can't just be, those are very broad ideas, but like, what hope can we give those people? Because otherwise they're going to find a strong man. Well, and, and perhaps you're lining me up for this, but uh, I think what we can tell people is the Canadian story that there is a story to tell people about Canada. The story exists. It's what drew people like the, the members of my family who immigrated here. Immigrants come because they actually like Canada. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, and so I, I think that there is a positive and most importantly true story to tell. And what... Let's get that story summarized in like give me give me three bullet points. I'd say that we are well, we are blessed, um, not quite uniquely, but getting up there in terms of rarity, uh, in terms of the the natural, the gifts of nature, in terms of resources, in terms of space, 
And we are equally as blessed, if not more so, in our institutions, in, uh, as, as I mentioned, a constitutional tradition that, uh, that claims almost a thousand years, uh, unbroken, if, if you include out uh, the English Civil War. <laughs> um, yep. Almost unbroken. Uh, Arguably, the the Glorious Revolution was was part of installing democracy at a deeper level. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'd I'd buy that. Uh, but Parliament was, uh, Parliament was, was in control of it. I, I mean, I guess the Glorious <laughs> the Glorious Revolution was sort of the the synthesis. If if you had the the thesis and antithesis of the uh, of the Cavaliers yes, and the Roundheads, yes, yeah. then the synthesis was. Uh, the process of the restoration and the glorious revolution that, okay, we will have that monarch, but the, that monarch needs to know that his or her place. Yeah. <laughs> and and the, the way that the queen, when she gets brought in to open up parliament is put in the, the same room with the death warrant of, yeah. of her ancestor <laughs> is very much parliament laying down the law yeah. of, yeah. <laughs> uh, look, you, you will know who is in charge yeah. here. Uh, we, we did it before. We'll do it again if we have to. Yeah. And and these are wonderful things that I, I wish more people knew about our constitutional traditions. And that's part of the story that we have to tell. And it's a, it, it's part of the story that, as I said, uh, immigrants to Canada know it. Uh, they know it because they, they're choosing Canada. And um, we're not so good at bringing our native-born people along with it sometimes. Why, why do you think that is? Well, some of it um, I can and will blame uh, our uh, somewhat radical uh, academy. And so, you know, okay, I'll, 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 I'll rant and rave about the lefties there. But I'll also blame uh, supposed bearers of, of the torch among conservatives that uh, these are stories we need to tell. And... Um, and it is very tempting, uh, especially given the media environment, to marinate ourselves in uh, all the stuff from the Great Republic to our South. But there's a lot that needs to be taught about our history, our, uh, our country that stretches from sea to sea, and we added the third sea, uh, <laughs> yep. it, which is, always has been true, but you know, <laughs> we just now, now said, we're yeah. saying it. Uh, <laughs> sea to sea to sea uh, was the, the word for the phrase for a little while. I haven't heard it lately, so maybe it's gone out it again. It might not be. It was definitely a Harper saying because he loved including the Arctic, but I haven't heard Both Martin and Harper right. did it. I know that for sure. I. I try to avoid listening to Trudeau, so it's possible that he says it. But uh, <laughs> yeah, who why, knows? why, why cause yourself pain by listening to that man? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's um, true. It's true. But uh, there are stories to tell about that, about uh, our long relationship with our Aboriginal peoples. Uh, the Queen certainly knew it. I think I might have mentioned it in my last uh, sit down with you when she came on her last visit, uh, most recent visit, might not be her last, in 2010. She brought along bells to give uh, to the Mohawk Chapels Royal in, in recognition of the tricentenary of, uh, of the Mohawk Embassy to London. And there, there's a lot of long-standing relationships. Canada's very much a relationship-based country, that uh, the relationship between the French and as they would say back then, the English, but you know, the Francophones and Anglophones and Aboriginal peoples. Yeah. And uh, there's a lot of history there and it doesn't get told uh, a lot of times. And um, if we want to avoid falling for whatever strong man or wolf of the moment, uh, we need to give people roots. Yeah. Or we oh. need to show people the roots that exist. And they can I decide whether they want them or not. Yeah, they but. can decide whether they want them or not. But I, I would like to think that more people than not who would view themselves as conservatives would find these roots attractive. Yeah, yeah I agree with you. Yeah. And in that sense, I, I suppose I'm, I'm still very much a small C conservative. Oh, you're definitely still a conservative. You're just not liking the party right now. <laughs> 
And I don't blame you. Like, well, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see. Uh, it, it's the, the, the party's going to have to win me back, I guess. Yeah. Uh, well, my, I mean, and I hope that it can, view. but I think what's really, I don't know if the party will survive and that's another, that's another story, right? Um, another conversation to be had. It, it, it is a, a rough coalition sometimes. Well, I mean, it's fallen apart before. It, it right? has, well, in the, the Diefenbaker years, <laughs> yeah. in uh, the Mulroney years. Uh, so it's not as if, it's not as if this is a, a permanent thing, right? Uh, but what I will, but I will, what I will say is I completely agree with you. And I think I love that your proposed solution is let's actually get to know our own country. Let's stop, you know, navel gazing, and and just being obsessed. I guess navel gazing is the wrong word. Let's stop. I guess I want a little more navel gazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. We want more. But let's stop our obsession with America. Yes, America is important. Yes, the whole world pays attention. But like, we are obsessed. Like it's it's like we're a, we're a jilted lover or something. Like like we care way too much about what's going on down there. Well, I guess the American Revolution was a rejection of the founding documents of Canada, yeah, of yeah, the Royal exactly, Proclamation exactly. of 1763, the Quebec Act, uh, or actually, I think in text, it's the British North America Act of 1774, although we, when we talk about the British North America Act, we mean 1867, yeah, yeah. but it was a, re- a rejection by the 13 colonies of that settlement. The settlement that has persisted in that Canada. That literally created Canada. It was they hated the idea that the Quebec law were getting. Oh. So we literally are jilted lovers. <laughs> I love it. No, you're right. But for us to move on and maybe, you know, get married one day and have well, a we, family. We chose <laughs> we chose to remain on this path. Yes. Well we we could have just said F it, we'll we'll join the Republic. Yes. Yeah. Would have made the biggest country in the world. Yeah. Um, but, uh, we chose not, and that choice not is something worth getting to know and, and, and understanding why. Yeah. And, uh, I would hope that a conservative movement of the future would, uh, delve deeper into that. I love that. Well, we're at the end of our time, Ben, this a pleasure as always, um, whether or not you join the conservative party again, you will always be my friend. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. And it's always a pleasure to uh, be a small part of telling the Canadian story. Thank you for listening to the Canadian story. You can find us on Instagram and Twitter at the CAD story. That's the CAD story. If you enjoy this podcast, please share it with your friends and family. Let's work together to remind Canadians how great their country is. 